How do we feed the world? The tools we have as a planet for answering that question, like so much else we've been discussing over the last few days, has cha have changed radically in the last 10 or 20 years. The technology, the underlying technology, the data, the intricate global supply networks have all changed. But we know that the climate, the environment, has also been changing before our eyes, and it's changing almost by the day, making the challenge harder in, in many ways. We've already got crop yields uh, affected, severely affected by climate change in some of the most vulnerable economies. In the United Nations, predicts average crop yields could fall by 30% if we don't change our planet. Could, change by, could fall by 30%, even as the demand for food by 2050 increases by 50%. So that's the long-term <coughs> challenge. But as I've increasingly realized talking to our panelists, there is a short-term crisis that actually many people in this room may not realize the severity of. We've been talking about food prices, but the, the crisis in the agricultural supply chain that has just unfolded in the last few months is now raising real questions, particularly for, for farmers on the ground. Not just the 30% rise in food prices that we know about, but fertilizer prices going to an all-time high. So there's that immediate challenge as well. But as one of the so one of the panelists was pointing out to me, and we think about solving both of those, how do we feed the world in this changing environment? We've got all pieces of that agricultural supply chain represented here. The science behind the resources that farmers use, the farmers themselves, people who work closely, someone who works closely with farmers, the businesses that get the food, the crops from farms around the world. And now the data we have to try and solve that question more intelligently. So I'm really, I'm really excited to have, especially as an economist who doesn't know enough about this area, I'm also hoping to learn, um, which is always the great thing about this forum. Look, Aloysius, I mentioned uh, at the start this, this crisis related to fertilizer prices that I think some people, at least, in this room would not be fully aware of. Just paint us a picture of that as before we sort of pull out and think about the longer term future. What's the situation right now? What's the challenge that farmers are facing today? Uh, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, so I'll focus my opinion on small scale farmers in uh, places like Africa. Uh, the reason is that they are often not in the middle of most conversations and they struggle to access high quality fertilizer and seeds. Just to give context, uh, fertilizers like MPK were invented like uh, over 100 years ago. Um, African farmers currently only are able to apply about 14 kilograms per hectare, while their counterparts in the rest of the world apply over 120 uh, kilograms. So they struggle, but at the same time, they are tasked with this enormous responsibility of feeding one third of the world today, and that responsibility is going to increase, uh, you know, come 2050. Uh, if you look at the situation happening in Madagascar right now, where um, for the first time in our modern history, where uh, there is famine and there is uh, fear of food insecurity for close to a million people, and this is not caused by war, but it's caused entirely by climate change, um, the time is now to come up with. Uh, innovation and services that actually ensures that small-scale farmers in places like Africa actually get high-quality fertilizers on time and the support that they need to grow more food to feed the future. Mm. And David McLennan, just thinking about, as I say, the, the, the short-term situation, how, how bad is it in terms of the, the supply chain, the more, the more global supply chain? I think uh, the food and ag system has proven to be very resilient, perhaps surprisingly resilient. I think it underscores the importance and the benefits of an interconnected food supply system. So we've been able to get food from where it's produced to where it's needed, with some exceptions. There have been spot shortages, there's been dis disruptions, but you talk, Stephanie, about 
the impact of climate change and you think about reduced yields, there's also the components of climate volatility, for example, increased hurricanes. So one disruptive event that we were impacted by was the hurricane that hit the Gulf of Mexico in Louisiana uh, early in the fall, which we lost two of our facilities where we load the grain that comes down the Mississippi River, put it onto barges or to ships to get it out. And we were shut down for several weeks. We have one facility that is still getting up and running. So notwithstanding the inevitable natural disasters coming from climate volatility, by and large, the food supply chain has worked pretty well in the last year or so with COVID, but nonetheless, it's something we cannot take for granted. Mm. Bernard Bowman, I've talked about people at different stages of the supply chain. You're fundamental to the science, the products that farmers are putting into their ground. How has, how has that piece of the challenge changed in re recent years, but also longer term? Well, I think, first of all, uh, we are witnessing uh, tremendous advances in science uh, that will ultimately uh, give us better products that uh, solve multiple questions uh, that uh, we are challenged by at the same time. And if I look at agriculture, uh, there are three things that are really important. Number one is uh, that uh, agriculture has to become more sustainable. Yeah, Now more than ever, if you look at the massive impacts that climate change is going to have on all of us, and that means that, climate, uh, that agriculture has to contribute its part to removal of greenhouse gases, gases. So we have to find these solutions. I can give you a few examples on that. The second one is um, that uh, um, we have to reduce the footprint that is being used by agriculture while at the same time increasing yields uh, because, as you mentioned, uh, we need to produce much more food in the next 20, 30 years in order to feed a growing population. Yeah? So 50% increase while at the same time uh, as a minimum, not increasing acreage, but ideally bringing uh, more intensification on existing acreage while at the same time freeing up acreage for reforestation and carbon sequestration. And uh, uh, the last thing is uh, that uh, we have to find much more resilience uh, in agricultural systems, which means um, you know, better varieties uh, that uh, can stand drought, uh, your know, other properties uh, that will plan, make plants more resilient and with that uh, create uh, you know, better and more predictable harvests altogether. So the two examples I would give, uh, since you also touched on, on fertilizer, is that um, you know, fertilizer has been uh, you know, a real blessing you know, to modern society because without the invention of uh, you know, nitrogen fertilizer about uh, 100 years ago, we wouldn't be able to feed the people that we have on the planet today. Having said that, after 100 years, there may be you know, the next big revolution coming that is informed by biology on one side, by technology and on the other side, by artificial intelligence. That's what you know, people call the biorevolution. And what we are working on specifically is to find ways uh, to teach plants uh, to fixate nitrogen out of the air rather than having it produced uh, and then go put on the acre, which is a huge contributor to global warming because that alone accounts for about 4% of greenhouse gas production annually. The second piece uh, that is equally important is when it comes to resilience of plants. Um, you know, in the 60s, uh, there was, uh, you know, one of the big then called green revolutions that was driven by the inventions of Sir uh, Norman Borlaug with a shorter growing and more resilient wheat that tripled the yield in India. Today, we are working on something similar uh, in corn. We are short stature corn, uh, which uh, is less uh, susceptible to lodging and which can pl be planted much more denser. Yeah, and can also yield other agricultural practice is the next big thing to come. And uh, you know, we've started that with you know, some pre-production launches in, um, uh, in Mexico and we are scaling up over the next years to come. Yeah, so those are the answers that we are working on uh, with, um, with our people. And Sarah, <coughs> Sarah Menke, when we think about sort of squaring the circle. One conclusion I had from, from talking to you earlier when I raised any of these fundamental questions, how do we square the circle between uh, more producing more food but uh, covering less land and, and saving the planet, 
as far as I can see, your company had the answer to all of it. So where, where, does, where does data and where does, where does grow intelligence come in? Yeah, I mean, in some ways, I think the answer is capital, right? All of this is going to cost money. And that money comes with risk. And you have to price the risk associated with the capital that gets deployed. And uh, you know, the example I gave you was I was, in my past life, an, an energy trader. And when I first started trading oil and gas, if a producer came and wanted to hedge oil two years forward, it was very difficult for us to go out into the market and sell that two years forward. By the time I left to start Grow, we could sell it 10, 20 years forward that funded all sorts of innovations in the energy market that made things like shale oil, shale gas possible. Gas prices went down. Coal got priced out of the market. Renewables became a possibility. So, but there was really long-term changes that happened because capital flowed well. Capital flows well when there is good information. And so data becomes necessary infrastructure for driving transformation and change because this change is going to require lots and lots of capital and lots of long-term capital. And agriculture capital today is too short-term. I mean, I think that, and, and data is infrastructure. We just, just view it as a highway. Yeah, probably Bloomberg is the one company that you don't have to give a lecture to about the importance of data and the, the power of data and transparency in pricing, uh, in, uh, in fueling a whole global company, let alone uh, anything else. That, the capital piece, I know, Aloysius, you're, that's one of the things that you're focused on trying to bring to farmers. So just yeah. explain that a bit. Well, so most farmers... Um, the only source of funding for most farmers in, uh, you know, in places like Ghana is, is mostly banks. Banks require farmers to bring some form of collateral in, in order to access capital. Uh, that alone is a limiting factor on how much money farmers can get. And farmers need money for, for a few things. They need money to access their fertilizer and seeds. Um, and without affordable capital, without enough blended capital around, Farmers are often constrained on the amount of fertilizer they can get to till their lands, grow more food, and make more money. So there's a massive opportunity uh, you know, to fill that gap. And that's what Farmerline does. We digitize over a million farmers, and we finance farmers, and we use alternative data sources uh, to give us information about the farmer, and that allows us to take risk. And in giving them money to purchase fertilizer and seeds, that allows us to purchase their food crops at the end of the season so that they can make more money. But we're just one company. We can't do it all. So there's a need for uh, governments, there's a need for BFIs, corporations, to come together and find new ways to make capital affordable for farmers so they can be able to get all the tools that they need in order to grow more food uh, you know, to feed the future. But how much is... So when Bernard Berman talks about the, the technological solutions of how do you use... You want to use less acreage, you want to reforest, you want to have the... Yeah. How much is that figure in the day-to-day -day calculations of the farmers that you work with? Uh, your trade-off. Yeah, it all comes down to training, you know, and, and giving out information to farmers, right? So they, the biggest challenge today is that the information that actually exists is in is in uh, English, is in uh, is online. It's not in formats that farmers can easily understand. And if you pass information down to a farmer and you don't train them properly. Um, if there's no proper training, there can be any change in behavior. If there's no change in behavior, there will not be any adoption. So the transition from old practices to climate smart practices actually slows down. So there is massive room to figure out a way to use uh, digital tools uh, to offer information to farmers in the language and the format that they can easily understand. Ghana alone has 58 local languages, 58. Nigeria has 200. So if you want to be able to communicate, um, you, know, you know, how to uh, use seeds well, how to, uh, uh, you know, plant to uh, reduce the impact of climate on the soil and farm, uh, you need to be able to meet the farmer where they are. And local language is one of the ways to go, giving them information in the language that they understand, leveraging the trust network that exists around farmers, the agents in their community, the extension officers. Those are still very relevant. And on top of that, Digital tools can also serve as a way to remind farmers to take action at the right time. It's very, very important. Knowledge alone is not enough, but giving knowledge uh, in a way that changes behavior, that's the only way to get an impact that we want in getting farmers to join the fight uh, you know, to help uh, reduce the impact of uh, you know, climate change on their work. And I mean, 
Werner or David, I mean, I think that, you know, if, if you're sitting from a global perspective, you know, often, certainly as an economist, you know, the, the problem is often that the resources will go to the developed markets, you go where the money is. And actually, when it comes to some, certainly we know the environmental challenges is a greatest in the places where perhaps the market opportunity has been smallest in the past or less obvious. So how, I mean, are we doing enough to help farmers do this kind of innovation? You know, I think, uh, maybe I'm not, I'm, I'm a specialist for the general questions here, yeah, and then <laughs> hand it over to you, Dave. Um, so, you know, if we look at, uh, you know, the universe of um, our customers, we cover the entire universe of farmers. Yeah, so whether it's smallholders uh, in India or in rural Africa, where uh, you know, I agree with Aloysius, we have to do much more yeah, to train and to get them better tools, better products into their hands in order to increase their yields, the resilience of their farming operations, and at the same time giving them an opportunity to, to raise out of poverty. But we also deal with you know, large farmers, large farm operations that are really industrialized. Yeah, if you look at you know, parts of North America or Brazil, so we have to have solutions for all of them and then also make sure that we reach these farmers, either directly or through our networks, to bring the technology and the product that they can really make use of yeah, in order to improve their operations along the different criteria that we talked about. Yeah, and, and that's what, what, what we are working on, what we are developing. Yeah, I think, Stephanie, to your question, are we spending enough time and capital where it's needed the most? The answer is no. And particularly in Africa, I mean, Aloysius did a very descriptive, um, I was a very descriptive spokesperson of what can be done in Africa, for example. So years ago, I was in Zambia, where we, are, we, have a, we had a farmer training program at the time, and they apply their fertilizer with a bottle cap from a soda bottle. And so you can, you can, do, and you can triple and quadruple yields by, here's modern fertilizer technique. Here's when you should bring your crops to market. Here's how you can store them effectively. Here's modern watering techniques, building up berm so to prevent erosion. But the scalability at a small scale, working with uh, farmers, and so I've listened to each one of the panelists, it all comes back to the farmer, yeah. whether it's data or seed technology, to Sarah's point about getting better data to, to help, to Aloysius uh, talking about training. That's where it begins. It's not just yields but it's also in terms of sustainability, which is a topic I'm, I would imagine we'll, start, we'll talk about in a few minutes. I feel like we're talking about it now. But yeah. <laughs> um, but, Werner, you mentioned uh, Thomas Balog and you know, the, the sort of tradition of, of, of green technology, of the, of the revo green revolution and continuing that. You know, obviously, there's been st at stages in the last 30 or 40 years where that kind of innovation has been controversial. There have been questions about the, the impact of it. You know, GMOs were the sort of latest round of that. Um, I would say the debate's been reopened by the urgency of, of some of the challenges that we're facing on the climate front. Yeah, you know, that, that, that's an interesting one, Stephanie. The first question is, uh, has that uh, controversy been uh, uh, you know, uh, going on for the right reasons or not? And if you dial back uh, to you know, when <coughs> the controversy around GMO began, it was actually a discussion uh, that uh, originated at Greenpeace when it came to the next big campaign yeah, that you could uh, spook most people with. Yeah? And which better area to do that than with food? That's where it started. Yeah? But I said, hey, we have to go after that or against that technology. Uh, because Whoever that's, of Franken foods. That's, that's a fantastic fundraising opportunity. And what they did with it, yeah, and you know, depending on who you talk to today, they will also acknowledge it, is that... Uh, that prevent an awful lot of people yeah, from having the benefits of that technology. In particular, if you look at, for example, vitamin A and rich rice, yeah, golden rice, that has been deregulated and approved in a number of countries by now, that would have prevented many, many, many kids from you know, getting blind yeah, because of that vitamin deficiency. So having said that, I think there's an increasing acknowledgement of how important that technology is for a number of reasons, also when it comes to sustainable farming practices. And what we see today, both with traditional GMO and then on the horizon, new modern breeding technologies, which means uh, applying new technologies such as CRISPR-Cas gene editing for precision breeding uh, that is 
quote unquote, nature identical and not transgenic. Uh, this is something that we see with, uh, let's say, renewed openness, yeah, also when it comes to deregulation. And you know, before we entered the stage, I was talking to Aloysius that we see that now happening in Africa, which is interesting that Africa takes the lead yeah, with some of these approvals now uh, in, in Ghana and Nigeria, where actually Europe is falling behind. We have it in North America, we have it in Latin America, and Europe, has been, which has been a little bit agnostic yeah, to some of these modern technologies for the wrong reasons, is falling behind. But there's hope that we'll catch up also with new legislation that might be uh, you know, uh, coming over the next years. Just to follow up on that, does the pace of that innovation now need to change? If the, if the, if the soil is changing, <clears throat> the climate is changing almost by the year in these countries, is that something that... Uh, you know, it's, it's not that dissimilar to the discussion we had uh, before or the, the panel had before on uh, you know, uh, uh, new medicines yeah, and how fast you can bring them uh, to market. Uh, also in agriculture, you want to be sure that what you bring to market is fit for purpose, safe for the environment, yeah, and of course safe yeah, when it comes to, to food and feed. So there is that element of regulatory process uh, that takes some time also with field trials. But having said that, we have never been in uh, a phase like the one that we are witnessing today in terms of advances of technology. And uh, you know, the convergence of technology that I was talking about before when it comes to biotechnology on one side and you know, making better and faster informed decisions yeah, with the help of artificial intelligence. Yeah? So uh, that is at the front end very, very fast. Yeah? And then certainly regulatory processes can be speed up uh, on top of that in order to address the challenges a little bit faster going forward. Yes. Mm. David, on the, just on the GMO piece, mm. I know it's not everyone's popular favorite subject. But is, when you think, when you talk about the, the long-term picture, is it, does it have to be part of the story e e for all of the discomfort some have? It absolutely does. So I, I'm in the, my, about to start my ninth year in this job. So when I first started in this role, 2013, 2014, GMOs were the hot topic, whether it be protesters and literature, and we could not figure out why, because ultimately GMOs... I mean, they got branded Frankenfood, but ultimately they have been behind since uh, the ninth, you know, early part of the, of the 20th century, increased yields, increased access to food, increased farmer livelihoods around the world. And they're a tool for sustainability. But the, the, the dialogue, the storyline got into the system, which is they're bad for you, they're, you shouldn't consume them. But... Things like, um, you know, what Werner talked about, crossbreeding or, uh, you know, their mangoes have been GMO engineered since the 1960s, but I think people became fearful of them. To the follow-up, Stephanie, about soil health, you're absolutely right, and th this next iteration, or I'll say the current iteration of sustainability in farming has to include regenerative agriculture, whether it be no-till, whether it be crop rotation, but to improve soil health and use soil for carbon sequestration is becoming more so and will become more so part of the solution to improve farmer livelihoods and to improve the greenhouse gas footprint of farming. Sarah, Sarah Manka. I mean, what, you know, I, I suspect you're going to say, and, and data, is the, <laughs> data is part of the solution to that as well, but, you know, you didn't set out wanting to solve the sort of the sustainability challenge, you were setting out just trying to predict what was going to happen with all these crops and everything. Well, I think sustainability is a part of it, right? I mean, I, I always say I, I set out to figure out how to model agricultural markets on a real-time basis. It was that sort of simple. How do you model the real-time supply and real-time demand of every agricultural product on Earth every single day? That was the, the goal. Now, if you think about m much of sort of the challenges we face as a society today, there's sort of a tension between the trade-off between economic growth and ecological preservation. And the cost that economic growth has brought to sort of preserving our environment. And if you're modeling supply on a real-time basis, you actually have to understand the earth, our soils, the environment, right? It is part of it has been, sustainability has bar, been part of agriculture since agriculture ever started, right? Like since the Neolithic Revolution, essentially. 
And so I think sustainability is, 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 is a core part of the agricultural ecosystem. And so it, it's not the data as an answer, but that it is actually agriculture and, and people who understand agricultural markets, I would argue, probably understand our earth, the environment, and climate in ways that the average person in this world don't understand because it's their reality every single day, mm. um, right? And so I think there's a big role that the agricultural industry can play in sort of sustainability conversations, not just in sort of the transformation of markets, but in education um, and in educating other industries um, and sort of in participating in dialogues in ways that I don't think happens, right? There was a, there was a famous quote I had seen once that said, eating is an agricultural act. And um, it was a t-shirt actually at a coffee shop and I, I bought it. Then I went and I got my team to make a new version of that t-shirt, which was living is an agricultural act. Because if you ask people the question, what's your first interaction with agriculture? When you wake up in the morning, most people say, my cup of coffee. They forget about the sheet of cotton they slept in. <laughs> they forget about the fact that the soaps they used have oils. They forget about the mint in their toothpaste. It is so a core part of our life and every part of the way we live, and we don't understand it. And I, th I really believe that sort of the contribution that the agricultural industry as a whole can have to dialogues around sustainability and to driving change in sort of the world is large, and I think we're only just beginning. Feeding the world is partly, the more you get into this debate, is partly about not throwing food away. If we're throwing away a third of our food, I mean, David, isn't that a, how does a, has a business like you ad address that issue? Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, food waste it exists at all parts of the chain. And so if anybody who is American uh, or has dined in American food service knows, the portions are obscene um, and rarely get fully consumed or they shouldn't be consumed for, for health purposes. But I, I think it's what we're focusing on is waste on the front end of the supply chain. So I think when you focus on improving farmer education, modernizing farming techniques, the use of GMOs to better utilize the resources that go into production of food, to production of everything, to Sarah's good point, that's where I think waste can be eliminated. And it's not as visible. People don't see the front end of the supply chain. They see how much waste they, you know, as I said, in, in food service in restaurants, or it might be in food that's gone bad. But I, I think there's various parts, and it might be in the middle part of the supply chain where it gets shipped or processed. But there's a lot of parts of the ag and food supply chain where waste you know, contributes to inefficiency and high costs. But I think what the consumer sees is just one part of it. From Cargill's standpoint, we're focusing where we're going to have a bigger impact, which is on the front end, where, where and when it's being produced. I couldn't help noticing that Elon Musk had a bit of money to spend on solving the problem of global hunger. I think it was six billion, is he? Five, six, six billion. So Aloysius, how should he spend his six billion? Yeah. What was your plan for him? I'm sure you sent it to him, you tweeted to him, <laughs> what the plan was. Well, you know, I wish I, wish I tweeted him. Um, I'm sure he'd tweet back by all accounts. Yeah, like if I get six billion, I would invest in infrastructure, right? Like, because fundamentally, like, I would invest in moving farmers, small scale farmers, from takers to a place where they have more options and choices. You and I, we can go on Amazon, Google, and order whatever we want. Farmers are often takers of services. We have one guy in the village that sells fertilizer, and that's it. Uh, there will be some aid project that comes and uh, does good work that will last for three, four years, and then they'll go away. Right, like what has to happen is that you need to have more options and choices where people compete on quality and price. Um, so I'll build infrastructure that will give them more services on the farm and that will give them more services in life too. Because farmers are humans and they, um, in order to, for them to keep growing food, to take care of how they need to be healthy, they need to be well in life. So that's what I'll invest money on. Um, and if you build infrastructure, uh, if they have good roads, they have good storage facilities, they would be able to reduce post-harvest loss. 
right? They will maintain quality of food. When they maintain quality of the food, they get paid more, right? So, and if they want fertilizer, like today, last year by this time, the price of MPK was 200 kilo, uh, you know, $200 per ton. Today, it's $1,000, right? If they have the infrastructure. So the fertilizer that's gone up fivefold exactly, last year. Exactly, right? And, and they did nothing to, to contribute to that. If they have the, if there is infrastructure, the people would be able to easily reach them and they'll compete on quality and price. So that's what I'll use the money for if, if given the chance. Bernard, where, where do you think Elon Musk should spend his six billion? Well, he could give it to us. Yeah, and, I don't get uh, the impression you really need it, but if there's it, uh, a, well, where's the, but, where's but, the market but, but, you know, failure yeah, that you should uh, be solving? I guess the question is, uh, what do you get, uh, where do you get most of the impact? And on a more serious note, uh, I think also coming back to what you said, Sarah, when it comes to uh, your growth on one side and sustainability on the other side, I think I would put that six billion to work to reconcile both of them and make whatever it is that we do really farmer centric yeah so the solution is the farmer yeah and you know that, that, that's a confluence of different things first of all the right technologies and products yeah, that are based on the science and the insights we have yeah. we have to bring to the table yeah the analytics that uh, you know, sarah and her company are working on a a functioning food supply chain with transparency uh, not only for big companies, but also for smallholders. And then having the right incentive system for farmers to not only improve the livelihood of them and their relatives, but at the same time doing the right thing for sustainability of the operations, which is a very interesting other angle where probably that six billion would be best used when it comes to your scaling carbon farming. Yeah. And carbon farming can be something that can be very powerful if you tell a farmer that you're beyond the yield of uh, his crops that he's growing, there's maybe a second and a third harvest when it comes to then being rewarded for sequestering carbon. Yeah? So with better and more sustainable farming practices, with cover crops, uh, with deeper rooting uh, varieties that they can buy or reforestation, yeah? and then having a market mechanism that allows them to monetize it. Yeah? And that's where I think all of us here uh, on stage are the ones uh, that have to work together to enable farmers doing that. Mm. David, I have to ask you also, where do you think is the market failure that six billion would help solve? I, I would go back to what I was saying about farmer education, training, regenerative ag, the points that Werner just made, soil health, to increase yields, but also increase livelihoods in places like Africa. And then I would also say uh, infrastructure. So, oh yeah, the US just passed a bill on that, but does it get to places like ports and riverways, uh, South America as well? So you've got this massive uh, crop growing region of the world, South America, which doesn't yet have the appropriate infrastructure to get it out of the fields and to the consumer. It doesn't do any good if you increase yields and increase farmer training and education if you can't get it to where it's needed. And so, but that's also true, you know, there's aging infrastructure in the U.S. What does it take? You know, was the disruption in the Gulf from that hurricane avoidable because of better infrastructure? Maybe. Maybe, or infrastructure that's going to be able to stand up better to the natural disasters which are inevitably coming with increasing frequency due to climate volatility. And then I would say whatever's left over to give it to Sarah and Aloysius' company to help farmers and to build the data. Well, ob yes, obviously, it goes, goes without saying. I mean, Sarah, I suspect a lot of the different pieces have been said, but wh where do you think would be a really kind of <clears throat> catalyzing investment that Elon could make? Well, I was going to say, it's going to take a lot more than $6 billion, <laughs> right? <laughs> and <laughs> that is, I was going to say, go to Mars, maybe, you know? <laughs> that would be his solution. He's already going. <laughs> But no, but it's going to take a lot more than $6 billion is what it is, right? And I don't think we want to trivialize the amount of investment it's going to take when we talk about infrastructure, right? It's infrastructure in terms of storage of grain for farmers, right? And, and when you are looking at um, small-scale farming, scale doesn't exist, and so therefore the cost of infra infrastructure is artificially too high. So how do you actually create aggregation methodologies that help us develop scale in communities and in parts of the world where that scale doesn't exist, right? I mean, these are really expensive 
like undertakings. And so my, my answer to this $6 billion is I would actually use that to create a financial institution mm -hmm. that would help create the mechanisms to start financing all the changes that then need to be made, mm -hmm. right? And I, I, and I think one of the things to think about when thinking about sort of the financial markets as it relates to agriculture that I had not fully appreciated when I sort of left to start grow is only a handful of agricultural products are even traded on a formal exchange. Most agricultural trades happen day to day, week to week. That's it. That's the way most of the market works. And we have to change that. Because I think, and, and you change that through capital. And, and I think creating new forms of financial institutions that truly innovate new models of financing agriculture is a place that I think one could put a lot of good use. You know, the $6 billion could actually realistically create that sort of next level infrastructure that I think is necessary. I mean, we, we gotta close in, in, in one second, but I'm just struck, I mean, you're all, you're all in different ways at the heart of this challenge. And as Werner said at the start, you know, there has been over the decades, there's always been a concern that we weren't going to be able to feed the world, that our technology for uh, expanding yields and other things would just not grow, you know, would grow arithmetically while the population of the world grows geometrically, and that's always posed this challenge. And we've always managed to do it, give or take. Um, when you look at how the goalposts are changing, how climate is changing the underlying ground, I mean, do, do you sometimes wonder, do you think this is actually the time we're going we're gonna to fail, even with our, all of our expertise? Do you have moments of doubt? No, I would rely on uh, the ingenuity of our people and, and the power of science. Uh, I said it earlier, yeah, uh, that level of comfort uh, is currently as high as it's never been. Yeah, we just have to find the right solutions with science and technology to solve the problems of society and the planet. Yeah. And I have absolutely no doubt that we are going to succeed. Oh, by the way, uh, you know, having an ambitious target yeah, that has to be aspirational, and then you know, aligning people towards moving uh, in that direction is, is actually very powerful. And to do that with aligned incentives, uh, it starts with organizations yeah, that have uh, the right incentive systems, also for the long run. Uh, and that is what is ultimately yielding the results we need. Well, if we, I guess if there was ever a 12 months that showed us the rightness of being confident in science and the mir miraculous nature of science, but also the humility we need in face of some of these rising challenges, it's the last 12 months. But thank you to all of you, and thanks for listening. <laughs>